Hey everybody, it's Damien Gergiev from The Breakdown Show. Today's guest is Aurora Winter. Aurora Winter combines the best of Silicon Valley with the best of Hollywood. Using her expertise in film and neuroscience, she helps people tell memorable stories that build brands, books, and business. Experts turn their words into wealth. Aurora will share how your audience can increase their income, impact, and influence with the right words. Great leaders are great storytellers. A leader who is a published author and a powerful public speaker has a huge advantage in marketing, sales, and advertising. Through her books, courses, and one-on-one coaching, Aurora trains people to create a clear, concise, compelling message. You can find out more about Aurora on thoughtleaderlaunch.com. All right, if you want to support the breakdown show you can go to breakdownshow.com and donate to the paypal link you can also subscribe to any podcast platform and buy our merch or you can simply watch our videos on youtube don't forget to subscribe to save the brave and help our veteran tribe fight ptsd all right enough of me here comes aurora winter lions rock productions This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. I'm Aurora Winter, and you are watching The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. So I'm in a backyard in a tent, Aurora, and this is where I do my recording because, you know, houses get really small when you're talking and carrying on and having a show all the time. And there are helicopters over the 55 freeway because someone shot a kid on the freeway. And so we're going to have helicopters throughout the episode as the uh, news coverage uh, goes on. <laughs> it's just the uh, oh, wow. wireless, modern, 24-hour news cycle world and uh, the world of stories, which is kind of a good segue for who you are and, and what you do. But let's talk about um, let's talk about the book and the idea uh, of just controlling the words that we use professionally and what that means, especially that whole concept of uh, 25X on the value of, of who you are, what you do, that kind of thing. Isn't that amazing? Well, with the helicopters in the background, I'll feel right at home. It's very L.A. Hollywood yes. kind of thing. We've <laughs> totally. always got helicopters buzzing yes. overhead. Um, yeah, it's so interesting. I think the, the difference between most people and those who really excel, uh, the leaders, the actors, the performers, the writers that we admire, is that um, those who are at the top of their field really spend time thinking about and training and mastering how they communicate. And like you were mentioning a moment ago, Pete, it's amazing. There was a study done, and I can give the details if you'd like, but that um, share that the right story can increase the value of an item by 27-fold. So if you're not focusing on your story, if you just focus on your product or your service, you're leaving a lot of money on the table if you don't also pay attention to the story that you're telling. This is an important thing because when you are, we'll pick on engineers. When you're an yeah. engineer and you come up with the greatest line of code or the greatest uh, gadget or, you know, widget, right? That's the MBA love. You guys love your widgets. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter if nobody cares about it. You know, it, yeah. you can have the greatest invention of, and probably the greatest invention of all time is something that nobody cared about and the guy couldn't market because they were like, but think, listen to how great my machine is. Listen to how great the service is. But it just didn't matter because if you can't gather people, you don't have a product. Exactly right, Pete. I've kind of got one foot in Hollywood and the other foot in, in Silicon Valley. And a lot of my clients, they know they've got the, the engineering background. They've got that uh, kind of gearhead brain. And they come up with fantastic things. But like you said, unless under people understand the value that they, they provide and the problem that it solves, it's, it's dead in the water. In fact, I've had a, a number of clients come to me with an idea. They're in a startup. They haven't raised any capital. And you know, by the time they finished learning how to communicate more clearly, concisely, and articulately, you know, they're off to the races, and they've raised seven figures, and they've gone on to have you know hundreds of employees instead of a you know a team that's helping them from the goodness of their hearts. You know, I remember one event I hosted in Vancouver, BC, Canada, 
And uh, Tarney Williams, who is the CEO of Blueprint Reality, was there. And the, the audience loved him. They knew he was smart. They knew he had integrity, but they had no idea what his, what his company did. But by the end of that event, once he nailed his message and communicated in a way that mainstream people could understand, people in the audience actually invested in his company. So that was a pretty quick turnaround. And I was so happy you know, to, to be the catalyst for that. Why is it so hard to get that right? Why is it such a challenge? I mean, a lot of, um, like right now, this show is going live on YouTube, right? And one of the things you battle there is gathering a crowd, you know, and, and the world, the way the world did is, and you know, the Hollywood side of this is everyone will come to you with ideas on how to take your audience and exploit it for their benefit. But, you know, nowadays, if you can build an audience by yourself, like on YouTube, you don't need a whole lot of other help because you can... Yeah. You can just gather enough folks. So there's that that gap in between. I've got this great, the Break It Down show is a great show, right? Uh, yeah. Largely undiscovered though, even though we've got a thousand episodes, we've had world famous people on the show. We've done all the things you're supposed to do to get discovered. And yet here we are with a lot of fans, a lot of people, a lot of revenue moving around, but still largely undiscovered. So how do you, how do you deal with that gap? How do you close it so that you can get over the hump where either you have the independence to not even need uh, an agent or, you know, a production company or uh, or how do you make yourself marketable to somebody like that if you've got all the hallmarks? Well, there's quite a few questions in there. So uh, yes. let's, let's tease them apart kind of one at a time. Um, so, for example, with the uh, with the Break It Down show, it is an excellent show. You've got top notch guests. The sound quality is awesome. You're now adding the video component. I had the pleasure of listening to a few episodes and I was wowed. And so I think in the example of the Break It Down show, you're not doing anything wrong. So I would suggest faith and persistence. I mean, 10 seasons, a thousand episodes, just keep it up. And it's like, uh, even when something's growing exponentially, the first few years, exponential growth can look like nothing is happening. But still, then all of a sudden, you know, it doubles and it doubles and boom, you know, it takes off. So with something yeah. like the Break It Down show, th there's nothing missing. You're not doing anything wrong. So just keep up the good work. For a more general question, you know, how do we um, devote enough attention to our message? I think there's a couple of factors that typically trip people up. One is just the idea that, well, they don't need to pay attention to their message. You know, they know everybody knows how to talk. It's like, well, everybody knows how to walk, but people understand that if you want to be a ballroom dancer, you need to train, you need to practice, you need to have it choreographed. Well, public speaking is a lot more like ballroom dancing than just walking. And I think that if when people lean into that mindset, they go, the penny drops and they're like, oh, right. I don't just have to do the same thing I always do, only I pay a little bit more attention where I'm putting my feet. This is a new skill and it deserves some time and attention in order to master it. Like anybody who's operating at an elite level really leans into that. I mean, Steve Jobs practiced for three weeks before each of the Apple launches. Why? Because it really mattered. And he knew that practice, practicing the right way would make it good. Oftentimes we practice the wrong way and then we just ingrain our bad habits. But, you know, he practiced where to stand, you know, how, uh, how he was going to emphasize different points. He got really comfortable with it and he had a great product and service. But, you know, I've experienced that in my own business as well. If you don't have a good message to go with it, nothing happens. But I think we can all look at Steve Jobs as an example of mastery and the elegance of a beautiful message. I mean, those were ads, <laughs> but they were must watch television, right? Yeah. And when you, if you live through that time, Apple was dead. You know, Microsoft yeah. had to help bail out Apple. It was just a brand that was going nowhere and didn't resonate. And then all of a sudden it's just become this, one of the biggest companies at times, the biggest company in the world in part because of his vision. And you're right. When you, when you look at a pitch, right, you practice it, maybe you practice it 10 hours and obviously any pitch you practice 10 hours, you've nitpicked, you've rejiggered, you've, thrown away whole segments and redone it and then gone back to the original and it's hand position and all of these things and 10 hours, you still got 20 something hours to go to get where Steve Jobs was, you know, and that's, yeah. it's not that you have to, ha okay, well, we're going to practice 500 hours, right? Like it doesn't work like that, yeah. but your competition, the people who are also asking for money are competing in all of these different facets harder yeah. than you are in a lot of cases, especially with the words. 
especially with the words. But the cool thing about the words is that anybody can practice. And you want to uh, you want to practice a lot. Like, you know, I had um, I lived through a period where which was very difficult. My husband died suddenly. I had a four year old son. My husband was also my business partner. So I had no business, no husband, no income and a four year old son. So what was I going to do? So uh, a lot of the time, I just tried harder at what I was doing, which was a, I was a fledgling screenwriter at that point. But then, you know, through coincidence, somebody dragged me to a party. I'm like, I don't want to go to this party. But I went to the party and, and ended up, you know, talking to somebody. Of course, they said, what do you do? And I said, oh, I'm a screenwriter. Tell me about your movie. So I told them like, and I got animated and excited because I was very excited about that particular script, which was about absent fathers and lost sons. So it related to my husband's death. And then he said, oh, do you want to pitch your movie and represent the province of British Columbia at the Banff Television Festival? And I'm like, who are you? Well, he turned <laughs> out to be the head of the BC Film Commission. I was completely naive. I didn't understand. I didn't. I was just being myself. Um, so that was an opportunity. Then I had an opportunity for a televised 20-minute pitch to talk about my movie. I'm just a nobody. Nobody's ever heard of me, but I'm a very eager writer. So I practiced for weeks. I practiced so hard, my shoulder went into spasm like before, <laughs> before the pitch. I had, I had to schedule a massage. But when the lights were on, I, I, was, I was on. I was excited. And, and that 20 minutes changed my life. It led to six figures of income. It led to a whole career in film and television. It led to my screenplay being optioned. And... So when you've got something you're passionate about and you practice, 20 minutes can change your life. But the other thing I realized at that, at that particular junction is I spent all this time working on my movie, writing the script, rewriting it, researching absent fathers and lost sons, and uh, practicing my pitch. But I hadn't really thought about how can I say yes? What if it goes well? And so... <laughs> I know, right? So thank goodness my agent was there to field offers on my behalf because I sparked a bidding war and spelling TV and some Canadian producers were, were like, we want it. What do you want for? And I'm like, I had yeah. no answer. So that's part of why I wrote Turn Words Into Well. I want everybody to be prepared to say yes <laughs> when your pitch or your book or your movie idea or your business idea is, is well received. It's also good to be able to say yes. <laughs> Yeah, what happens when they say yes is the next book. <laughs> you know? And what happens when they, another book you should write, and you know this from working in Hollywood, what happens when um, you no longer have to worry about the next gig? You have to marshal saying no. Because if you say no too much in Hollywood, they quit asking, you know, and yeah. they go look for the next person. We had Ali Willis on. She's one of the most famous and successful songwriters of all time. And, and I don't know if you know who Allie is, but she's got this, this is for the audience, I guess. She's got this museum of a house where she's got all this uh, pop culture stuff. And she called it a, a, a museum for kitsch. You know, and you had like just all kinds of hair products, brushes, just things that were Americana. And her house was so packed full of this stuff in a way that wasn't crowded. We didn't even recognize that she had a whole wall full of platinum and gold records, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so she could write a tune to anything. She said, yeah, you could throw a bunch of stuff on a table on a back. There's a tune in there and she'd write it. She wrote songs for Earth, Wind and Fire that we all know, like September, Boogie mm -hmm. Wonderland. I mean, these are songs we all know. But the problem with that is that the music, music industry kept coming and kept coming and kept coming to the mm -hmm. point where she's like, I hate writing songs, you know? I, I just mm -hmm. I want something else. And this is funny. She tells this great story about how, um, you know, she wrote the song, the theme song for Friends, right? Oh, wow. She didn't, she didn't want to write it. She <laughs> owed one seventh of a song to the studio, right? To, I guess it was Sony or Warner Brothers. That's who it was, Warner Brothers. One seventh of a song. So she's like, all right, I'll write this stupid thing. And the Rembrandts happened to be in town and they had some contractual obligation. And so they kind of just mashed them together and said, make a TV theme song, you know? Nobody yeah. wanted to do it, but it would just yeah. happen. And so in this case, the thing she hates turned into maybe one of the most money-making songs she ever wrote, you know? Uh, it's funny. The things that you think are going to be hit then, you know, are not. And the, the yeah. ones you just like, oh, God, I've got this contractual obligation. And then they, they hit it out of the park. It's it's funny. I once got caught in a middle seat flying from Los Angeles to uh, 
uh, flying from Vancouver to LA between two friends actors, David Trimmer and Matt LeBlanc. It's the only time I didn't mind having a middle seat <laughs> after yeah. a ski vacation at Whistler. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> You said something earlier too, but I want to go back to, you know, when we're all trying to figure this out, and I think it's fair to say a lot of people in the last year have done some significant work on redefining what life is going to be like for them, whether they're young yeah. and upcoming, mid-careerist, want to change late career, whatever it is, we've all done this exercise. And part of the problem is how do you raise money? How do you meet the right people? And you said you went to the party you were going to say no to, and it's always easier to stay home and not take that opportunity. Yeah. But getting out to that meeting, to that party, to that happy hour, you, you just never know. And if you're getting better at going, it's less drudgery. I mean, it's always hard to get up off the couch and go do it. Yeah. But so many times it's paid off in ways that don't even are in constant. I would never even considered and aren't even that big, but I'm like, I'm really glad I did that. You know, <laughs> it's always the way it's the one that you, you know, really don't want to go to that turned out to be the one that you really needed to go to. But I think that little story, the other gem in it is that I wasn't actually trying really hard to pitch a person right. in a position of power. I was just answering the question and I got excited about, you know, my, my movie and, that genuineness. So I think that's the other thing for us to balance. Mm. You know, sometimes uh, people are so negative about marketing that they shoot themselves in the foot. But marketing yeah. it needs to be leaned into because if you've got a gift to give the world and you hide it, <laughs> you're not doing anybody any favors. So I think marketing is really just the process of sharing your message with others, you know, and the message is not for everybody. Your message, you know, with the Break It Down show is specifically going to attract, you know, people like me. I really enjoy your show. But if we try to be all things to all people, you know, that's Pablo. That's no good. So be who you are, be enthusiastic, but also consider the possibility that you, um, you are doing the other person a service by sharing what you're up to. Because miracles happen not when we, you know, make the other people like fight to find out what the heck we are doing and why we care. You know, entrepreneurs solve problems at a profit. So what problem do you solve? And the other thing, you know, yeah. really quick tip that everybody can use in their communication is when we take the focus off ourselves, like one of the things I teach, teach my clients is when somebody asks, what do you do? Make the answer about them, not about you. So instead of saying, I'm a podcast host or I'm a screenwriter or I'm a, a trainer, you know, say, you know, what the value you, you provide is. So, for example, mm. for you, you're going to do it, you know, a better job, Pete, than I am. But, you know, what I do is I host you. This is for you, Pete. You know, what I do is I host the breakdown show and just share all these amazing guests to benefit the world. You know, and then it's like, oh, well, then they can ask more and they can find out more about you, Pete, and they can find out more about the Break It Down show. But you've shifted the conversation from being just about who you are, podcast host, one of the things you do. I mean, that doesn't go anywhere. But if you change the conversation to what is the problem that you solve and who you solve it for, it's a conversation, right? And then the people who need that gift will go, hey, that's the show I need to subscribe to. Yeah, I'm already trying to subscribe to this show right now. It sounds great. By the way, anybody who <laughs> is watching for the first time uh, on YouTube, the best place to watch. And then also uh, click the subscribe button because that's a big help with what we do. You're right. We, we do try to, I try to have really hard, we try to have really hard conversations sometimes that make us uncomfortable because we can have them in a practical way. And then we can also have conversations about life, about music and all these incredible things. And when I, when I pitch the show, like, well, like what's your elevator pitch? Someone always just wants to critique my elevator pitch. And I'm like, why am I even bothering giving? Cause everybody says something different. It's like your resume. I'm going to show you my yeah. resume. Like, are you going to look at my resume to give me a job? Or are you going to look at my resume to give me more work to rewrite my resume in some way? Like yeah. everybody always wants to refashion, People love to give me more work. How do you monetize your podcast? And I'm like, well, there's a lot of different ways to happen. You know, like, here's what you need to do. And I'm like, yeah, you know, why don't you do that for me? Oh, no, I'm not doing <laughs> But this is, there's a lot of advice. And even like when, when um, the, the folks over at Interview Valet were setting me up with you, I have to go look and see who you are because there are so many business coaches. There are so many people that have mm -hmm. advice and so many people that write books. And I know you're yeah. a big proponent of writing books and I agree with you, but there's so much noise. I had to make yeah. sure that like you had something to deliver, which I, you definitely did. And I loved it. And that's why you're here. But yeah. there's so many versions of you. There are a billion versions of me. I mean, 
saying you have a podcast is like saying you have pants, you know, like it's, <laughs> it's hard to stand out with all these messages. And, you know, like, um, I don't know, there's just so many people that have written the same book and said the same things and God bless, go yeah. make money and go do those things. There's a lot of noise out there. Yeah. So a couple of things on that. I think one of the reasons why so many books might seem similar-ish is because people, they, they write their book, hopefully, but then they pull back, you know, oh, that, you know, this part would maybe offend some people and this part would maybe offend some people. And maybe I don't want to confess that dark night of the soul. And so they pull back. Mm -hmm. And so what could have been like a raw, authentic, super helpful book becomes more you know, towards the middle, <laughs> goes towards the middle. So then there becomes the sameness. So what I, what I, what I'm an invitation to is what if your, your most authentic, your most raw stories, your worst life experiences, your worst business disasters <laughs> are part of your most valuable message. Yeah. And that, you know, what if when you share the dark night of the soul or the hell that you have gone through, that then people will be, oh, I trust Pete. I believe Aurora. And then they're willing to also hear, you know, how you turned it around and they'll have a deeper listening. And so I think most people, unless they, um, you know, have had this kind of epiphany, they, they, they uh, erase or try to hide all the flaws in their life story and in their character. But then we don't trust them. You know, I love Joanna Penn. She's got a really great podcast, The Creative Pen. And she says, double down on being human. And wow. I love that. You know, my background in Hollywood, people were like, no, let's double down on airbrushing and Photoshop. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think yeah. doubling down on human is, is so valuable. And I want to hear, Pete, how you've shifted with the pandemic. You know, and I know that you've given yourself permission to have some holidays. And I'm like in awe of your thousand <laughs> shows and your your ongoing commitment to it. Yeah. But one of the <laughs> ways that I shifted during the pandemic, I was in Silicon Valley. I was raising capital for a startup. And uh, and then I thought, you know, what what is the life that I really want to lead? Yeah. Why do I need, you know, millions more dollars and a bunch of people who are on my team who will be needing me to respond to their emails to to do what? To have a life for me, the answer is to have a life where I can where I can write the stuff that I want to write and I can have meaningful conversations yeah. with people and I can make a difference mm -hmm. to my clients and I can have, you know, the freedom to go skiing or hiking or biking and not have my day jammed. I'm like, that's the life I already have. <laughs> Why don't I just keep it simple? <laughs> so, right? you know, I can't, I usually host a couple of events per year and cancel them with the pandemic. And then I doubled down on instead of going, you know, wide and shallow, I just have a few VIP clients. I take them all the way through the book writing process. I, you know, interview them, we create a podcast, I create the book, I market the book. So it's like, you know, uh, done with you, hand holding mm -hmm. all the way and free therapy on the side. And how many clients do I need? Not very many. And yeah, so I have the yeah. freedom now. I'm writing I'm writing my uh, fantasy books as well on the nice. side with, you know, no need for them to ever produce any money just because right. I want to. Right? This is how about you? How did the pandemic? Yeah, go ahead. No, but yeah, and I want to answer that question. You know, this is the interesting thing, right? Like you have to find something that you're willing to work hard enough at to be competitive, to be professional. And I've proven that with the podcast, you know, a thousand episodes, incredible guests on and on and on for yeah. days and days. But that's not what it does. You know, like, how, can you work 70 hours, 80 hours, 100 hours a week? Yes. And at some point you have to pull back and you have to look at it. That's one of the things I did last year was just go, OK, I was doing five episodes a week to get to a thousand to show everybody that I could I, I can produce. And there's no doubt about that. And I was looking for clients to help them do podcasts. And I still am. But it's so rare to find someone who can do the work to actually have a good podcast. You know, it's just, it's hard because mm -hmm. um, there, a fairly well-known actor approached me. He's like, hey, I want to have a podcast. And ultimately, after talking to him, I said, uh, you really should just do, go get another acting gig. Go, go, mm -hmm. don't start another business because that's what you're talking about here. You know, you want to have something that's monetizable. Yes, you have a name. Yes, you have a brand. But unless you have 70 hours or you want to pay me for 70 hours for the work, 
you really just just go go get on a couple of procedurals and, and just do what you already do. And, and I don't well, want to tell people not commitment. to commitment. What's that? It's a big commitment. I mean, hosting is. a podcast is it a big is. commitment. It's like have it's like having a baby. You, you know, like you need to baby. care for it every week, yeah. every couple, you know, every couple of it days. It craves time and money. And this is the yeah. thing I realized. I'm still glad to put projects together for people and everything else. But that done with you thing, it's it almost doesn't work with the podcast world because you just have to go out. I can guide you. I can teach you how to swim faster than you will. But mm-hmm. I can't promise that you're going to have a hit because it's 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 on you. You know, like it really is. Yeah, on you to go out and do that. And so I, I've stopped pushing so hard for those kind of clients because they're very hard to find. And uh, I've just focused on other things because there's so much opportunity in this in this particular venue. You know, just knowing more people who create big shows. Like you think if every HBO miniseries had an accompanying podcast, I could do that all day long. And instead of allowing somebody outside of HBO to create this thing as a fan show or whatever, why not create that in house? You know, and just finding more people like that makes more sense to me to think bigger on the production side. But that means going that to more meetings. Sense. That means being on the 405 more. And, oh, and, God, the 405. It, yeah, and is that it's worth it? I don't freeway. know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Trap I don't, laughs> I'm not convinced it's the next idea, but, you know, these are the things. And this is where that hard work iterates into creating elegance and knocking edges off. There's all kinds of things I would love to do, but I'm not going to do them. So I'm trying to find the things that hold passion and hold promise so that I can make, you know, just a little bit more money. I, I don't make much, but I only need a little bit more, you know, so I don't need to be a millionaire. I don't need those kind of problems. So I, well, I'm try happy it. with where I'm at, you know? Try on these three questions. I, I love okay. these three questions. These questions right. helped me when I pivoted from one business to another. And after I, I took my MBA and then I'm like, okay, now what Aurora you can do yeah. almost anything, but that's too many choices. Let's narrow it down. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I can feel your pain. Oh my God. So I asked myself after I got my, my MBA in 2015, um, these three questions to narrow down my choices. So what am I really good at? So, you know, what have you got the 10,000 hours or more of practice at is a good, a good filter mechanism. Uh, what do I love? Okay. You're going well, through the question. I'm going to give you three and then, uh, then okay. I'll give you a second to think about it. <laughs> And then filter it by what do you love to do? Because I, I've launched a couple of tax shelters. I'm good at doing that, but that's so boring for me now. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but I, I love other things. So that I filtered by, okay, what do I love to do? And then the third question is, who is it worth the most to? So do you want to play with me? Do you want to answer those three questions? What are you really good at? Like, what have you got 10,000 hours? Obviously podcasting, you're really good at. Yeah. Well, and podcasting really is, is a new iteration of my work in the field in Iraq and Afghanistan as a spy, right? So what would I do every day? I would go out and have these conversations to try to find out what was going on in the area. So I'm still doing the same thing now. It's just safer, uh, oftentimes over over you know a camera and a, and a screen, but it's the same thing. And then I would write a report about this is what I, this is who I talked to. This is what we talked about. This is what I think it means. And I would bring these little snapshots of humanity back into, into the American side of things and then try to reflect that back to the locals, right? So that we could all kind of commingle as much as possible our realities. So I'm really good at that. I'm really good at going out and entering into uncomfortable spaces for a lot of other people. For me, it's not uncomfortable because I've done it. Like when I do prep, I do prep, but a lot of the prep I've done is in those 10,000 hours. It's behind me, right? So I could interview you cold and not have to worry about a thing because I already know how to do that, right? In this case, yeah. I prepared for you specifically because, because there's so many people that try to do business coaching. I wanted to make sure I had something original to say. But within a few minutes of hearing you talk on another show, I had it, right? So I'm great at that. All right. And then... Do you still love all of that or what is it that you love to do? Because that might be a subset of the things that you're really good at. Yeah, I mean, I do. I love it. I love putting it, not only the conversations, but I love putting the stories together and and being able to do it. And I would love to be on the road more now that we can. You know, we're going to Tennessee. We're going to go do some stuff there. I would like to do some kind of a podumentary kind of projects. Problem with this is uh, I can want to do it. I know I know how to do it, but the funding to have somebody else pay me to do it is uh, is the problem with that. I haven't been able to bump those cars together so that I can get that train going in the right direction. 
Well, that brings us to the third question. So who yes. are those wonderful skills of the things that you're really good at and that you also love to do? Who's that worth the most to? That's a really good filtering question. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. I mean, content providers, right? You know, there are so many different people that are creating new streaming platforms and they need stuff to fill that that time. But uh, well, your idea about HBO or other shows that have got a thing going on and then you could just, you know, you could just do it for them. It would be worth a lot to them. You'd solve a problem that they know that they have. You can the send me my royalty have, fee once yeah. you close the deal. <laughs> and honest to God, the problem with that is they're desperate for content and they want people to do what I can do. But you knock on the door and no one ever answers. You try to jimmy the, the locks and, and you go around to the windows. You know, it's like a, um, LA Times has a partnership with Wondery, right? For podcasts and everything. And I don't just have yeah. to do podcasts. But I can go knock on Wondery's door. I can go knock on LA Times door. And if they don't, you know, because I'm not part of the system as an independent person, they, um, you know, they don't, they don't take meetings. They don't return phone calls. They don't respond to emails. And that's always mm, proven to me. That is a problem. You know, yeah, and, and yeah. so they're desperate for this content, but they're not desperate enough to talk to people that have content, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I know you know how this works in Hollywood. Like you have to be allowed in the room so that you can get into the room and pitch what you do. Yeah. Getting the pitch meeting is, is, is important, but then you need to be able to pitch once you get in there. Well, the, the other thing, you know, I think you're doing just fine and, and you'll find a way to add even yeah, more yeah, value yeah. Yeah, to, the, to the world. But for, the, for, for others, and you might want to do this as well, the other, the other questions I asked myself um, were, you know, what am I really curious about? So I just mm. like brainstormed 24 things two dozen things I'm really curious about. And then, um, you know, what problems do I like solving? Yeah. And so when I just like, you know, brain dumped uh, uh, two dozen things I'm curious about, it was all in the communication field. I noticed afterwards, like it was like yeah. screenwriting, comedy, stand up, podcasts, you know, uh, writing books. I want to spend like... some time right here though and talk about this because okay. when I talk to people about you, because everybody wants to know like, how do I do a podcast? They always want to know about, about monetizing. And I'm like, yeah, monetizing will come if you're good at it and you spend time and you invest money and all that. But you know, what do you like to create? Is it a podcast? Is it a conversation? Did you love painting as a kid? You know, we all had much more creative passion and time when we were younger. Mm -hmm. And then we start to lose track of that because we have a four-year-old kid. And, you know, we have a house and someone's always got a broken arm and, you know, the time to, to spend creating things. So I always ask folks, like, what do you really enjoy creating? What, like, what draws you? What calls to you that is even unavailable even? And I find that a lot of folks struggle with that answer. Like, what brings you joy the minute you start doing it? Mm. Well, for you're asking me, I assume. So sure. obviously, I'm the only other person here who could answer. <laughs> well, what brings me joy? I'm this weird combination of I love coming up with business ideas. At the dinner table when I was a kid, we would always come up with million dollar business ideas. I have a lot of myelin or you know brain connections around that. Yeah. And I have launched several successful businesses. And, and it's just natural and easy and fun for me to, to put two disparate ideas together and say, hey, did you maybe consider putting those two yeah. things together? And the person... A lot of people don't uh, are not comfortable with that. So that's one of the things I love to do. That's a gift to others. I love getting to know people. I'm really curious. I'm um, very empathetic. And I, and I love to know, you know, how did you become to be the person that you are today? And what makes you tick? And what might be uh, stumbling blocks for you? And usually people open up to me. So I, I uh, have very intimate conversations. And I love that. And oftentimes I can be... Uh, catalyst for for healing or for for a shift or a change of mindset that's really profound. So I love doing that. And then the third way I love to create is any kind of writing or or talking. Like right now, we're co-creating something together right here, yes. right now. You know, your your podcast show. So what I do now is I I um, combine those three things typically. So my ideal client is somebody who would like to create something. Usually it's a book, but sometimes it's a business, which needs a, right. some kind of communication element, like like a pitch or a podcast or a YouTube channel. But oftentimes it's a book. And um, and then I, you know, get to know them. And, and But then we do reverse engineer it. So I'm, I'm not so much a fan of build it and they will come. I think it's ah. really good to, you know, reverse engineer it. So my book, Turn Words Into Wealth, actually shows 
seven different ways people can monetize the book. Because one of the things that hurts my heart is people put all this love and energy into a book. Typically, first-time authors take three and a half years to write their book, and then they publish it, but they haven't they haven't been on any podcasts. They haven't gotten any social media channels. They haven't thought about any buzz. Yeah. And so it nothing happens like crickets. And that's a tragedy because that book could be really good. And maybe they put 10 years of their wisdom into it. And it, maybe it's the answer to various people's prayers, but yeah. it doesn't go anywhere. So what I do now is you know, I help people reverse engineer the kind of uh, result that they want from their book. And then I interview them sort of on a podcast like this, but then they've got the podcast and they've got the audios and the videos and the clips. So three months before their book comes out, they can, they can leverage that. And then we transcribe the, the podcast to make a messy first draft. People can get about 8,000 words an hour though. So once they know know what they're talking about. Yeah. And, uh, and then I help them publish and promote their book. So that, those are the things that that fill me with joy. So being creative, being a coach, and coming up with breakthrough business ideas. Yeah, that that kind of creativity is special too, because it does. If anybody can publish a book, but not anybody can sell a book. You know, and that really is the new differentiator now. And you can anybody can become with the right trickery and money. Anybody become can become a best selling author. You know, it, it's. Mm-hmm. it's just a reality. You know, I can go get, I can go pay for a million hits on YouTube. I can do that right now. Yeah. It wouldn't be real, yeah. but I could say, Oh, I've got a million subscribers. You know, I paid $5,000 or whatever it is. And I would have a million subscribers, you know, it, it really can be happening, yeah. but, but that isn't what yeah. you want to create. Well, yeah, because I think we can get distracted filling our ego instead of filling our bank account or filling our soul. So, and, you know, that can really trip us up in North America. I hope the pandemic can help correct because it seemed to me that people were op- generally optimized in North America for just one component that a, a successful life equals money in the bank. That's like, no, I hope people get it. Like you want to be healthy, right? You want to be happy. You want to have meaningful relationships. You want to do work that's meaningful and you want to have money in the bank, but not so much money that you're working 70 hours a week at something that you loathe and despise. And then your wife has an affair with the pool guy and, you know, your family falls apart, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah. Not your wife. Not, I don't know your story no, but it's, it's I don't true. even know if you're married, but right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I think what is helpful to counteract that, how many hits, how many Facebook, how many likes, is if you focus on meaning instead of response. Mm-hmm. Um, and if, if you are doing something meaningful, like my first published book, I honestly thought it would only help one other person, another young widow whose husband died suddenly, who happened to have like a, a four-year-old son. I was so naive. Right. Um, and, and I wrote it for that person, but in my heart, I was like, you know what, if only one person reads this, but it changes their life and helps them not suffer as much as I did, it's worth it. And so then when it, the book came out from Heartbreak to Happiness, I was like kind of surprised that Wayne Dyer endorsed it. I was shocked that people emailed me and said, hey, you know, I'm on my deathbed. This book really helped me or weird things. Or I thought at the time weird, you know, I lost my job. I got fired and your book really helped me or my pet died and your book really helped me. So what I discovered is the emotional journey was similar. And so that book is called From Heartbreak to Happiness. And as I shared going from heartbreak to happiness, people thought they could too. So um, what is the point here? The point is that's so meaningful to me. It's not a New York Times bestseller. I haven't promoted that book because it's, I've only now gone, oh, I should probably promote yeah. books on Amazon. So that whole publishing playing field has changed. When that book came out in 2005, it was a whole different playing field. And so maybe I'll promote it now. But But I'm happy with that result because it helped people I don't know, maybe it even saved a life. People yeah. were desperate. And so if you can redefine success into what's meaningful for you, and if you can also uh, appreciate that having a life of creativity where you're interviewing interesting people that you want to interview is already a wealth. It may not show up like the dollars in your bank account, but it's a, a meaningful, wealthy life. You look like you were about to say something, but I don't know, maybe the connection trying space. there it goes yeah I'm, I'm just, there's an airplane flying overhead to land at john wayne ah, i was trying okay. to mess with my <laughs> mute button and then my mute button wasn't working anyhow uh, i'm so glad you said that because one of the things with podcasting and again answering that question well how do you monetize it it's like well 
if you only think of monetization as money, then it's very challenging and nobody should ever create one ever. But if you think about the enrichment factor, you know, like getting to meet you, uh, getting to travel and go meet other people. You know, one of the things that's incredible is I can go to Malibu, sit in some extremely successful person's house right across their kitchen counter. And they're looking at me saying, hey, do you want a juice? Can I make you a muffin? You know, and they're being like, how many times does someone get to interview somebody who's world famous and they get to be the host? You know, like it's yeah. just totally a new dynamic. And I get to share that. The other day I had on Jack Carr, who's um, his books inspired Chris Pratt to um, create a, a, an Amazon series on his action adventure novel. Right. And so this guy is he was a Navy SEAL. And, you know, and that's as, to- as good as you can be in the military. And now he's one of the top authors in the world. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you got someone, you know, optioning a script is one thing, optioning and, hey, we already got Amazon, we're doing a deal, we're going to create this thing, and it's series number one. I mean, that's a whole different thing. And so I was able to take him, and he comes on, and he's great, he always supports other veterans and everything. And he came on. Well, meanwhile, um, a subgenre of that, a guy named Michael Broderick is an actor. He works all over Hollywood, also a former Marine. He's like, I want to be in on that job. So I'm going to create a short. I'm going to create a, a small 11 minute story in that Jack Carr universe. And so he did that. And Jack's like, I love this. And he pushed it forward. Chris Pratt loves it. Now Michael Broderick has a job acting in that series, right? So I, love I have that. Jack. Isn't that great? It gets better. Jack Carr comes on the show to talk about his new book. And I'm like, hey, Michael, why don't you come and co-host? Because it's one of the things I do. And I bring different people together so that you can have these conversations that aren't possible. So you have this, this you know, clear bromance between Jack and Michael. And they're both tickled that this is all working out so well. But now we get to have them all and have this conversation in real time. And you get to create something bigger and better. And I learned that. Well, I learned that in Iraq, actually. But I, I learned it for a podcast. Like I rediscovered it because I realized, like, I don't have to just be the host. I can bring in anybody to co-host. Who would I pick if I could have anybody? So now not only do I get to pick anybody in the world to talk to, I can now find the perfect co-host to go with them. And who says no to co-hosting? You know, everyone exactly. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you want a female, so, but it turned into this I'm really fine. magical I'll thing. Volunteer. Right? Yeah. Well, you're you're signed up. Let's do it. All right. Well, and you were also a catalyst, like you were part of the glue that made that magic happen. So that is yeah. so, that is so cool. Yeah. So, and I want to just add to this conversation about all the different kinds of wealth. Like I, I tested my title. So the book is called Turn Words Into Wealth, but the back cover says Turn Words Into Wonder, Wisdom, and Wealth. But that was too long for the title. But, you know, we can turn our words into so many different things. And yeah. wonder is one of them. Yeah. When we have learned something and then we share that wisdom with others or all kinds of aspects of, well, just sticking with the W words for the moment. Yeah. <laughs> but words are, you know, stories are what makes life meaningful. Stories are how human beings create meaning. Stories are the DNA of of our wisdom passed through the centuries. Like we are so enamored with science, but not science can't tell you what is the right decision. Can't, science can't tell you what is the right way to live and how humans have communicated these values to others is through stories. Stories stick in our hearts and minds. So if you really are passionate about sharing something, tell it in a story. And then the person will be left thinking about that. <laughs> Yeah. I, I love this about your book and you're right. We, <clears throat> and we, this has been a theme on the show, a soft theme, you know, a light motif, if you will, but we have access to all the data in the world, all of it, but we don't seem to generate more wisdom for it. You know, so we, we have all of this stuff and yet we struggle with basic cultural problems. We struggle with so many different things and that wisdom is often, it's often, uh, well, it's absent. You know, and so we have all these yeah. data points and, and it gets confused and it turns into this noise. And then also wonder. And I always talk about joy and wonder myself, too, because if you're able to collect those moments, then it's easy to focus on the last time you were in a rage, you know, and you were shaking your fist at something and mad at a computer or whatever it is. Right. But if I was to say, hey, Rory, when was the last time you were just just overflowing with joy or when you just mouth agape wonder? When was that last time? 
uh, this morning when I climbed the mountain and just looked at the neighboring mountains, they're snow capped and and spring has just sprung. There's so many flowers and the lupins are blooming. And it was just like, thank you, thank you, thank you. Started my morning with a lot of appreciation. Yeah, yeah. that's why I'm happy to have more time. Yeah. How about yeah. you? What was the last time that you had that feeling? You know what? Uh, I had some time. I woke up early. You know, I've been trying to work through a couple things in my head that a project. Nothing crazy, but just, you know, my brain activated early. And I thought, you know what? I, I live about halfway between Disney and Newport Beach. And I was having a conversation with one of my production people in Macedonia, which is crazy to say that. And he's like, what are you doing? Well, like, I'm driving down uh, to the beach. I'm going to go see the beach, turn around and come back because it's less than half an hour round trip, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I drove down, I saw the ocean, I saw the sand and I thought, there you go. Mm-hmm. You know, whatever's going on, you live 10 minutes from the ocean, <laughs> you know? And then by the way, it's Southern California. I live 90 minutes from the desert. I live 90 minutes from wine country. I live 90 minutes from a mountain, you know, whatever I want. It's all right here. So yeah. I'm already done so well. I've already so enriched. And I just, I just really, I paused for a moment, just a moment. But I thought about all of that and how fortunate I am. Like you can say whatever you want about California and we're a bunch of hippies and a bunch of lefties and all who I don't care. I don't live here for that. I live here because of the diversity of everything, the geographic yeah. diversity, the diversity of opportunity, anything, you know, it's, yeah. Yeah. it's and that's what, that's, my my answer to your question about my question <laughs> yeah i've lived for for decades in california i'm in vancouver bc canada right at this moment but um my son's in los angeles i love the wealth of opportunity so we have to uh, consider not just what are our goals but what kind of life do we want to lead what mm. kind of experience do we want to have you know one of my clients has got this book that we're working on together called world building and he's mm-hmm. his background is with uh video games he's shipped billions of dollars of video games but applying that yeah. to our own lives his name's tarney williams i should acknowledge him um applying that to our own lives like what kind of like life do you want to have and so often we have goals that are i want to have this many followers i want to have this much money in the bank i want to have these kinds of you know accolades from others but that's not about your life. That's not about your life experience. That's not about how much wonder or delight or creativity or richness or freedom that you have. Or it's not about how many opportunities you have for connecting with new people like you were talking about or learning new things or having an enriched experience of traveling. So I really challenge everybody, you know, what kind of life do you want to lead or what kind of life have you already led and yeah. how could you share that and, and help others and ha- be of service? Like, I think the imposter syndrome, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I think that's another thing that gets people tripped up on, you know, how many social media followers do they have? Because I think it's very easy to connect with that energy of I'm not good enough. I'll never be good enough. Right. And I went and got my MBA because I'm like, well, maybe I'm not good enough. And then I did my MBA and I'm like, okay, I already knew all of that, but I've got the degree now. So this is as good as it gets. Right. (laughs) If you don't like this package, then I'm not the right person for you. But um, when we can shift our focus, from ourselves and getting that gold star or that uh, a certain number of Facebook followers or an Academy Award and instead think, I only have one life. Who who do I want at my funeral and what would I like them to say about me? Yeah. What right. difference do I want to make? Yeah. That is, uh, again, talking about the value of life and, and what you want. Uh, we often... It took me a long time to learn this, and I'm still trying to master it, but we often set the bar at eight feet above our head. We have to jump over that bar, and we get so mad at ourselves when we don't get over it. Uh, yeah. I don't write a, I haven't written a book yet. I've got so many books in me, but um, I just can't afford to spend six months writing a book and another year getting it published and have it not sell. I just can't. I can't afford that. I, I physically, financially can't do it, right? So. Mm-hmm. I, I haven't figured out how to lower that bar to the point where I'm like, well, I'll just write a hundred words a night. Cause if you write a hundred words a night, at some point you've written all the words you need to write and you can put that book out and, you know, making it valuable to one other person would be a good lowering of the bar for me so that I don't have to make $25,000 on a book. Right. So right. Um, then I can justify the time, but it, but it's, yeah. it's tough because for me, the bar stays 
higher than I can reasonably expect to do it because I can't, you know, I just financially, I don't make a lot. And so I have to allocate my time in a way that makes sense, but it's easy to make that into a justification for not writing a book. And with that said, right. I'm constantly working on the books, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not, I'm not pushed to do them because I've also got this wonderful outlet here where, like you said, you know, I, I can write a book in 10 hours by just speaking it and, and have it just mm -hmm. be here. And so I do that all the time as I share these ideas and share these conversations. And so the show is sort of a book, but not really though. Well, uh, yeah, exactly. I can give you some tips in a second. Cause, cause sure. I think they would be wonderful if you wrote a book and I think it is wonderful that you have a podcast. I think the, the interesting thing about a book in order to, you know, leverage to the next level, it is very helpful to have a book because it opens doors and, you know, the root of the word authority is author. And I've loved books since I was a kid. So I'm biased. So if you want to, uh, an unbiased opinion about books, eh, you would not get it from me. But I love books because they're basically like telepathy that can time travel. They can travel, you know, through time and space. And somebody can open the book up and have an intimate conversation, really, with the author. Hundreds yeah. of years after that person is is yeah. dead, and and thousands of miles from where they live. So you know, I've been personally mentored by Ralph Waldo Emerson and by C.S. Lewis, and they've changed my life. And I've never met them. I did yeah. meet Wayne Dyer, and he did also change my life and endorse my first book. But I'm still listening to his uh, to his audio books and reading his books, and they continue to add value to my life. So I do love books. But you're in a great position because it's not enough to have a book. You probably need, you know, one book and then 100 pieces of other content. You got a thousand yeah. episodes already. So you're good on that. But you could do what I do with my clients or I'd be glad to have a call with you and see if I can help you. Um, it's just, you know, create a structure for what is the theme that you want to talk about so that it's got a container. And, and then yeah. uh, the, the, the work is actually creating the structure. I love the book Story Grid which I believe is available for free on storygrid.com. You can actually get my book, Turn Words Into Wealth, for free. Right now, those of you who are listening live, it's free until the end of May. So those are two free resources. And then, you know, once you've got a structure for what you want to talk about, you could have somebody like me or a friend interview you, or you could just um, make yourself uh, questions and then talk on your podcast transcribe it and then you've got a, a messy first draft then you might want to delegate that because if you're not a word wrangler you might yeah. go oh that's a mess <laughs> but you can hire an editor like often you know uh, edit considerably edit whatever the messy first draft is but you could delegate that process there's thanks to the internet so you can work with people around the world and then have your book produced and then, of course, there is the marketing of the book, but that would attract. I mean, it's just a cool thing to have if you like books to have your word yeah. in a book. And thanks to Amazon it, and Kobo and Apple Books, you can publish right. a book and it can be available worldwide in the click of a button. How cool is that? Super cool. And you should uh, hire an editor, by the way. <laughs> I get you to read a lot definitely. of books and, and I'm no editor, but I can tell when someone else is in an editor too. <laughs> it's, yeah. It can be a lot, yeah. you know? Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I, mean, I hired are, an editor for my book, even though you know, if you got an advanced review copy, you might have seen it before the final proof. But um, it's just good to have multiple eyes looking at, at things and yeah. Once you've read something a dozen times, you're probably going to miss the same typo again. I can read it once. I don't want to miss the typo forever until I until I publish <laughs> it, and then I can see all of them. <laughs> you know, so, I love writing you, aid and editors are your friend. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I uh, I love that you talk about being mentored by Emerson and by uh, Lewis and all these other people, uh, Elliot, whoever, whichever people you mentioned. You're because, um, let's see, Cervantes told me some hilarious jokes that he wrote in 1605 about a guy who was a little bit crazy and tilted on windmills. I mean, you're right. Yeah. This is this is that person's best effort that they had at the time. And I'm positive every one of these authors, if you brought them back and said, you know, was this perfect? They'd be like, absolutely not. I didn't explain this very well. And three books later, yeah. I was, you know, I'm, if you read, um, we all talk about Orwell. We had um a guy named Dorian Linsky come on and he did a biography, like a really deep dive of one of 
of Orwell's books, 1984. And in that came the whole biography yeah, of, of Orwell, the man too. And yeah. And so you, you realize just how much he evolved in his lifetime. So we always say Orwellian this and Orwellian that, and every, every political party leverages his work. You know, he's so ubiquitous, but when you dive in to his words and you see his struggle as an author, uh, as a guy yeah. going through wars, as a, a generally unlikable guy you know in a lot of ways <laughs> you know you read and you get to know this person and you're like oh my god this is their like this is the best that they could do and if i can't find value in that then um what the heck am i doing i love having authors on because they've really had time to think and they've had these moments of brilliance and they've chosen to write them down and then they got someone to publish them and then someone to sell them and it's like that's how powerful <laughs> these words are and we choose to ignore them but i would say that that you'd be wise if you didn't well, and I also think we need to give ourselves permission to evolve. In our instant, you know, microwave society, we want everything yeah. done right now. Picasso is another great example of that. I mean, I took my um, my MBA in Italy, uh, a place called Chimba. So I had a lot of chance to travel through Italy and, you know, every be driving a little car. And every, I was like, okay, well, I'm hungry. So let's stop at this town. I have no idea where I am. And so then I would always ask, you know, have you got an art gallery? And they would say, point me down where it was. And I went into this one art gallery and there was amazing art. I felt really drawn to it. It was so realistic. It was very realistically done. And there was a lot of blue shades. And then I was like, that's Picasso. That was his blue period. Like he learned how to paint very realistically. Yeah. Most people don't uh, appreciate fully how much he gave himself permission to evolve. And we don't in our society today give ourselves permission to evolve. So master something and then do something else. I mean, life is long. What if you live to, this is why I took my MBA. It's like, what if I live to be 115? I would definitely yeah. regret not doing it, right? <laughs> and it, it's a good reason to write a book or launch a podcast or yeah. start your startup and pitch to rates capital or start your YouTube, whatever you want to do. Like, why are you waiting? Yeah. Memento more. We don't live forever. That's true. And, and this goes back. <laughs> we were kind of talking about earlier is um, don't set the bar so high and it's okay to change your mind. It's okay yeah. to go. You know, I really wanted to try being a travel writer. I did it for a little bit and gosh, I love traveling, but turns out I like being home you know, or whatever it is, <laughs> you, you get to change your mind and you get to say, it's not, yeah. it's not always quitting. Sometimes it's evolving or iterating into the yeah. next thing. You're like, yeah, I tried that. Like, we know that I like the podcast. I've done a thousand of them. It's hard to do something a thousand times that you hate, you know, unless you're getting paid really well for it. And then you're just like, Ugh. And, I, and we both know people like that who like, they create movies that get them paid so they can do the one project in eight that they want to do, you know, cause that's, that's their yeah. curse. They get to do the thing they love every day. They just don't love what they have to do to do it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm all for filling things up with uh, mostly the things I actually love to do and they're full of wonder and, yeah. and delight and making a difference. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we are living longer and longer and healthier and healthier. Right. So it would make sense that we looked at our life more like, what do we want to achieve each decade? Who was it, mm -hmm. the famous guy who did that? Was that uh, Leonardo da Vinci? I might be wrong about, but I think yeah. he was, you know, he, he set goals for each decade. Right. Um, but somehow we don't give ourselves permission to do that. I think that's one of the reasons people age is because they, they're living Groundhog Day, the <laughs> same day over and over, you know? Yeah. What about if you, if you gave yourself permission to, to be the, the learner again and learn new things, learn about hosting a podcast or writing a book or whatever the case may be, right? Um, I would love to ask you this question. Because, Please. Which is, what is, the, what is the worst advice you have ever been given? I mean, it's all the same. It's the good advice too, you know, uh, the, the thing, the critique, which I kind of consider advice is, you know, I always joke and say, work harder, rr, rr, rr. you know, like you can't just train more, <laughs> rr, 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 rr. you know, you, you have to find elegance, you know, um, when you want to solve a problem like policing, we all want better policing. Okay. And the standard answer is the advice is, is, yeah, you just need more training. No, are you telling me that the training department and all these police departments is like, gosh, I wish we had something to do. I just sit here all day. Like They're all working at their max capacity. If we want more training, we would have to have, I don't know, let's say 40% more cops. 
We'd have to also pay them more money because of all this training and expertise you have to give them. Uh, you're also going to get hurt more. So like all of these things add up to a lot more money. So you can say, yeah, we need more training. But the reality is like you need to pay these guys not $120,000 a year, but $180,000 a year or account, account that much per person. Who's in line for that? Raise your hand. You know, like, oh, hold on. I, I want to pay $8 an hour, you know, and it doesn't work. So we have these these advice things that just, they don't add up. We have these big problems yeah. that are multivariate problems. Same thing with medical care. If you want to have state-of-the-art medical care here in the United States, I don't know what the answer is, but I know it means that everybody has to give up everything that they have right now and then <laughs> create a through line and go, here is how we take care of all these things. Then you don't get to keep what you have. You have to give it all up. Now, everybody get in line yeah. in, in, the, in that sacrifice line. Oh, nobody's in that line? Oh, okay, great. Well, then, you know, we're not going to fix it. So these things were yeah. like, this is the answer. I find those things to be silly. And um, I, I don't think the person is silly. It's just we're struggling with a hard problem. And so why wouldn't the answer be simple? But multivariate yeah. problems don't have simple answers. Exactly. Yeah. And, that, and, that's and those why are political think, statements for anybody thinking I'm getting political. I'm not. I'm just <laughs> Problems are hard. They're problems. They're we have problems, problems that the Greeks and the Sumerians have that we still have today. Yeah. You know, class, yeah. structure, all that. That's always existed. So how do we get better at reducing it by half a percent? And if we can't do that, then why are we trying to change the whole thing? You know, that that's the kind of advice. What about you, though? Well, I was going to share uh, David Goggins when he was asked this question, and then I'll answer for me. Um, he, he said the worst advice he ever got was from a New York agent who said that if he self-published his book, he would only sell 5,000 copies. Uh, but David Goggins decided to self-publish, as you probably know, his book's called Can't Hurt Me. Yeah. And uh, he sold over a million copies in one year, as well as I think 600,000 copies of the audio book. And I don't know exactly how much he made, but probably in the order of $20 million. <laughs> and he can't so stop getting booked to speak, you know? And he can't get to, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and yeah. he's yeah. catapulted his star to the next level. So I just wanted to leave people with that because I think people have this idea that self-publishing or I like to call it indie publishing is uh, is is the path of choosing to only reach a few people. And it's not that way. It's It doesn't have to be that way. And he mostly chose to self-publish to not l lose control of his story and not give his rights away for 75 yeah. years. But he also made a lot more money. Yeah. So I think that oftentimes the middle person is being taken out uh, of the middle uh, in all industries. So let's just get over our yeah. ego and instead see how we can be of, of more service. I think the worst advice that I ever got was, was just, sorry, yeah. you want to say something on that? Yeah, please. No, no, you go. Oh, I think the worst advice I, I ever really got was um, a, a coach who was very helpful and taught me a lot of things, but he was totally focused on all of his clients bringing in a million dollars gross. And I kept saying, yeah, what about net? <laughs> there was no yeah. conversation about net. And I think yeah. that that is that is out there. A lot of people focusing on the the big splashy gross number, but at what cost? You know, one of the the people who was in that uh, mastermind group with me, he did make a million dollars, but he only had a hundred and seventy eight dollars in his bank account at the end because it was yeah. gross a million, but it was net a hundred and seventy eight dollars and a lot of stress. <laughs> So always look at the net, not the gross yeah. of the yeah. situation. Yeah. The other thing I want to say, and, and this is like, you know, kudos to you because being able to shepherd people through the publication process, it, it is not a simple thing. If you want to write a book, you can for sure get a publisher to, to do it. If you try hard enough, you'll find someone. But no matter what happens, whether you self-publish or you get the biggest house in the world to publish your book, you have to be salesperson of the year for your book. If you yeah, don't go out and outwork that corporation, because they've got the net, as soon as your book is published and the deal is signed, they're working on the next book. They will give you the attention they owe you. But um, yeah. I know a number of authors who signed great deals. They did a great job. Their book did so well. And the publisher was always trying to say, we're not going to do the next printing. And they're like, uh, the hell you're, and you know this to be true. Like, uh, yeah. we're not going to do a fifth printing. You're like, why wouldn't you do a fifth printing? Well, there's not that much demand. They're like, I'll be right back. I'm going to go sell 10,000 <laughs> books because they knew how to do it, you know? And so yeah, exactly. just because you get published, you still have to be able to 
tell your story and market yourself in a way that makes people crazy and bananas for your book. Well, and that's one of the reasons I wrote Turn Words Into Wealth, because I think that so many people assume that if they get an agent or they get a publisher, that's it. They don't have to market it. And that's not true. So I really wanted to show like seven different examples with a bunch of different stories from yeah. Tim Ferriss to Arianna Huffington to so cool. um, uh, all kinds of stories about how people uh, can self-publish, indie publish, and then f- think through their back end. And that way you can afford to give books away. Like right now, my my book is is free. I can afford to give my book away because I don't have a publisher. I've you know published through my own company, same page publishing. And um, you know, I'm happy the book was, you know, number one new release and it's already got thousands of new new readers since yeah. it's been launched just a, on May 5th. Um, because I'm focused on making a difference and, and I hope that the book will encourage many people to write their own book and have their own story and and I'm filling my my heart's bank account with that. <laughs> and people that make a difference get opportunity and people want to do things with them and and yeah, just so many different ways to get involved and help you guys should all find your thing definitely go to storygrid.com that's where that uh, reference from earlier in the show there's that if you're inclined to spend money on amazon and buy a free book which is not going to be free forever you can get aurora's book on amazon that will help us out that will help aurora out turn words into wealth or you can get it for free for a limited time and where can they get that at aurora and i'll put that on the screen actually they can get it on amazon for free the ebook is free until the end of okay. may and then i mean books okay. are so inexpensive but it's available as a soft cover or hardcover book, so you might as well support the show and and get the the soft cover or hardcover uh, book. Um, and those of you who are listening later, it won't be free. But uh, ebooks are not expensive. I mean, people spend so much time and effort writing a book; it's ridiculous how little books cost. They're such a great way to learn to learn things. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> go see live shows. Go buy books. And then uh, if you if you aren't sure what to do with that book, give it to somebody else's a gift. Wow, you can re-gift a book, no one ever gets mad. You can always, always do that. 